Hi, my name is Hannah Carty, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, my evidence-based protocol in which I used a femur fracture. Um, femur fractures are rare in the adolescent population and occur more in middle age and commonly in the elder. To cause a femur fracture in the younger population, a traumatic force such as a car wreck or a football tackle must occur to cause the bone fracture. Um, the patient we are specifically looking at is a high school football player, age 15, with a mid-shaft femur fracture. Um, he underwent a corrective surgery with a mid-shaft rod or a intra intramedular nail place and with this placement they had to cut his leg open so therefore he has incisions of the midline uh, incisions along the midline of his femur. The patient will not have this hardware removed unless the patient starts to build discomfort after the bone is healed. Um, here's our smart goals. For the immobilization phase uh, we will want him weight bearing with crutches four weeks following surgery. Um, we want to him to work on his range of motion of the hip and knee. We want to limit um, any atrophy we can, so we'll have him do some isometric quad contractions, and also we want to decrease that swelling. Um, on to the progressive resistance stage, we want him to start weight bearing without the crutches as tolerated. We don't want to push him too far or else we're going to be going backwards. Um, we'll have him still at optical range of motion for um, knee and hip flexion. Um, again, work on strengthening at this point, so strength, straight leg raise with ankle weights, and then uh, we'll have him bike without resistance, therefore he's kind of firing those muscles and trying to get them to fire properly. Um, and then later on in the press resistive, if we feel like he needs to add resistance, we can always do that as well. Um, in the functional stage, we'll have him work on his endurance with walking a lap and jogging a lap. Um, next, we'll have um, him, oh, we also will be using the uh, lower extremity functional scale, which is kind of like um, daily living, and so by the time he's at functional, we want him at 75, the max score that they can get is 80, and so we want him pretty much back to the normal functions of daily living at this point. Um, we want him to be at full range of motion with hip and knee flexion. Um, and then at this point, we're going to have him doing sport specific drills like cone, cone drills, cutting drills, checking drills, and figure eights. Um, and then we'll have him return to practice um, with no pads and non contact. And we see how he does then, and then gradually progress him to contract drills. Um, next is maintenance. We'll have him work on his endurance. Uh, maintain his strength for the quadriceps and hamstrings, which are the most um, affected muscles with the femur fracture. Uh, maintain his flexibility, go through a full practice with 100% functionality, and then maintain his confidence. Um, the first modality is cryotherapy during immobilization. We would not, like, there's some cryotherapy that are not to be used on suspected fractures. Also, you'd want to be aware of the injury surgical site because you would not want to place cryotherapy over an open wound. You would also not want to use cryotherapy if there was any nerve damage that occurred during the surgery. Ice packs would be applied to decrease pain and swelling, but we would have the patient sit with the ice pack laid like passively over the top of like the area for 25 to 30 minutes because we do not want to add compression. Um, Along with ice packs, core wool pool would also be beneficial to help decrease that swelling and increase that range of motion. And with a core wool pool, we use a time duration of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, during the progressive resistive, he would not like cryotherapy would not be really beneficial at this point because we would mostly be using thermotherapy. Um, unless we want, never mind. Um, functional after practice soreness, we could um, use ice packs. For, to decrease muscle fatigue. Um, also, ice packs can decrease nerve conduction, therefore increasing um, our patient's pain threshold. And that again is a time duration of 25 to 30 minutes. <coughs> um, um, have a patient um, to reduce pain and decrease muscle spasms after a high intensity workout with um, overexert overexerting those muscle groups, we'd have them go in the cold wolf pool for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, 
Next is thermotherapy. We would not use thermotherapy in the immobilization stage, and this is because thermotherapy will increase the inflammation process, which will increase blood flow and increase the cell's need for oxygen, and this will lead to not only an increase in swelling, but an increase in secondary hypoxic injury. Um, progressive resistive thermotherapy would play a huge role in this phase, but we have to be cautious of our patient's incisions because an open wound is a contraindication for thermotherapy. Um, moist heat pack um, would be great to be used. That is a time duration of 20 to 30 minutes, and we would need to refresh that heat pack every 10 minutes to ensure that there is no loss in temperature. Um, moist heat pack would increase blood supply as well as increase tissue elasticity, increase tissue elasticity which will lead to a great stretch in the muscle. And if you take tissue elasticity combined with mechanical stretching, that will increase the, increase the patient range of motion, patient's range of motion, which is one of those um, top goals that we have for the customer's phase. Um, functional, um, to get away from um, some moist heat packs, I wanted to use the active exercise and have him on a stationary bike for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, this will increase, increase his tissue, tissue temperature and increase his blood flow just like it would any other thermotherapy modality. Um, and this could be done before the application of therapeutic massage, therapeutic exercise, or traction therapy. Um, the clinician in maintenance would use thermotherapy to warm up the patient's soft tissue before an activity is seen fit. So like before a big game or something, if the patient feels some tightness, then we could use thermotherapy or throw them on the stationary bike to kind of get them warmed up and ready to go. Uh, massage. Massage and traction modalities would not be used in the immobilization phase. And the reason would be because due to the patient's uh, amount of inflammation in this phase, um, the possibility that the incisions may not be completely healed, and as well as the fact that this modality may just cause our patient too much pain. Um, the physiological effects would be detrimental to the pain because massage at this phase would increase inflammation, blood flow, and swelling, therefore resulting in additional secondary injury. Um, next is massage can cause, um, massage would be beneficial for the increase in blood flow in the next stage, progressive resistive. We would want this increase of blood flow to the area so that it'll help remove some of that chronic inflammation that may occur. And massage can also help prevent blood clots, and since our patient is recovering from a surgery, this is a good tool to have. Um, next is functional, um, and we also need to keep this in mind for whenever we're at progressive resistive because massage can also help increase muscle elongation and therefore increase our range of motion. Um, so in functional, we want to decrease pain and decrease muscle spasm. Um, because, and this is, happens because we increase tissue temperature with massage, which increases tissue elasticity, and if we add that with mechanical stretching, it'll increase patient's range of motion, which will also, it can decrease some of that pain and muscle spasms. Um, finally, maintenance. Using massage in this phase would just be needed for pain or any tightness. Um, um, as I said before, massage heats up that tissue, which would um, provide the muscle with some uh, relaxation. And also, massage can be used as a warm-up technique to prevent any further injuries to occur. Next is e-stim. We would not want to use e-stim at all on this patient because of the metal implants. Because metal implants is a contraindication because it can cause our patient some severe shock. And especially if it's applied over staples, because then that intensity could be out of our control. <laughs> Next is ultrasound. Ultrasound is kind of funny because we would only use it one of the three. This is because ultrasound um, uses deep heating. Um, if it's non, if it's if it's thermal ultrasound, it uses deep heating, and so that's a contraindication for the metal implants because you would be heating the bone from the inside out, which can re a result in a burn to the patient, which we obviously don't want. So we would only use ultrasound in the first in the first phase, which is immobilization, and that's only when we're using non-thermal ultrasound at a duty cycle of 20% and a frequency of 1 megahertz for 20 minutes. Um, and this uh, low-intensity pulsed ultrasound 
if we do a 20 minute session per day has proved been proven to improve healing at a rate um, of acute femur fractures <coughs> um, and this triggers um, some anti-inflammatory action to remove debris um, next is laser and laser is good to use in the immobilization phase only if we use it in order um, the frequency first we would have to use a thousand megahertz to decrease swelling and once the swelling has decreased we would then use 50 50 hertz to decrease muscle to decrease muscle spasms and pain and then go to a thousand hertz to then um, do fracture healing um, Laser speeds up fracture healing by stimulating osteoblast formation and osteogenesis at the fracture site. This in turn speeds up the healing process. Um, so then we move to the progressive resistive stage, which again is the time to three to five minutes for the frequency of 50 to 250 hertz, and that is for tissue repair. And then we move to 1000 hertz for increasing range of motion, which is definitely one of our top goals for the progressive resistive stage. Functional, um, there's other modalities that would be more beneficial in the functional stage, so we'll really kind of overlook laser at this point. Uh, maintenance, um, laser would really only be used to kind of mediate the pain of chronic inflammation um, or chronic pain. So um, laser can mediate pain by the release of nitric oxide and the degrees of C fiber activity. <coughs> um, so as a summary, um, during the immobilization phase, we can definitely look to cryotherapy, ultrasound, and laser for um, kind of hitting our treatment goals. Progressive resistive, we would look to thermotherapy, massage, and laser as our treatment goals. Functional, we would look to cryotherapy, thermotherapy, massage, and laser. And maintenance, we would look to cryotherapy, thermotherapy, and massage. And just as a, like, as a disclaimer, we would also want to make sure that we're following some good rehab um, and therapeutic exercises as well. So here's my references and thank you for listening.